Candy Kennedy and I are, are doing this together because we collaborate. Um, a little bit about me. I am from this area. I know many of you. Um, my husband and I have fostered for 13 years. We've had 80 children through our home, and most of them have gone home. And I'm really excited about that. You want to? I am the Nebraska Foster. Do all of you know what the Nebraska Foster and Adoptive Parent Association is? Yes. Oh, some are shaking. Yes. <laughs> We are the, um, the associate, we're a statewide association, we're 11 years old, and we uh, do advocacy, training, and support for, for resource families. And resource families are any family that's taking care of someone else's children. They're, they're uh, licensed foster families, approved kinship homes, child-specific homes, um, adoptive families. So um, we, are, we are that, that advocacy and support for those families. I think we did the first two slides. On. Oh, you want those slides? Oh. <laughs> do you want it? Do you want the punchy thing? <clears throat> no, the next one's mine then. So. Okay. And I'm Candy Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Um, we too have been around for about 11, 12 years, and with I'm the statewide family-run organization, SAMHSA funded and it's family run, it's family members that have children with behavioral health challenges. Um, and we have, actually I have affiliates that are located across the state that actually do the peer-to-peer -peer support. Here in Scotts Bluff, um, our organization is uh, Speak Out and we have a couple representatives here today. So, and Pam and I started talking one day because historically, um, <clears throat> Our parents, both sets of parents, don't necessarily um, do much collaborating historically. Um, but then we started talking and how important that is and understanding what that would require us to do. And we came up with this brainstorm. So, and this is what actually, when we started looking at working together, collaborating, um, what's really needed. Um, and we came up with this, which we'll, we're termed, it's nationally being termed as icebreaker meetings. We came a up with a list of um, birth foster parenting goals for our project. Uh, meeting with families as early as possible, build positive relationships between birth and foster parents. Statistics show increase in positive outcomes when positive relationships are built. And to build informal supports, more informal supports, um, when the professionals come and go, those informal supports are there for a lifetime, so they're very important. Um, we decided that um, we will use evidence-based practice. That means not pra practice-based evidence. We, we want to work what works in our system in Nebraska. Traditionally, as parents working together and with our systems, what, what that means. Um, identify, we wanted to identify foster parents who believe in the philosophy. Um, there's a learning curve going on. We have um, some parents and foster parents that have been there, done that many years ago, and um, um, don't necessarily value each other so much. So it's very important when we start this um, pilot project to initiate that with the foster parents that believe in that collaboration and uh, understand what that reunification requires and are committed to that. Um, um, no protocol for the family, for the birth families. Um, you know, when they come into the system, whatever that looks like. Um, our goal is timely and successful reunification as everyone's long-term collaboration. So, um, and to begin to change, the, the big one is to begin to change that negative stigma the perception of foster parents are bad or birth parents are bad. The, other, the other thing that we find is that the, our organization also uh, mans uh, what we call the inquiry line. So any new foster parent or anyone that wants to foster calls our line and we get them going in the licensing process. Well, what we find is about 90% of the families that call into that line don't want to foster, they want to adopt. And so if you've got a family that is licensed foster parent and gets a kiddo into their home 
and they only want to adopt, it's real easy if they don't have a relationship with that birth family not to work towards reunification. <coughs> if I don't know that family, it doesn't, bother, it doesn't hurt me not to work with that family, okay? But if you can get that relationship going early, early on, then it's, and, and you know, I think a lot of times foster families think those birth families are just awful. And you know what? For the grace of God, go I. It could be any of us that end up in that situation. Sometimes folks just don't know where to turn for help. And that's why their children end up in care. So we want to start out that relationship. And Candy and I would like to see it within 48 hours. And I know that's a really quick turnaround. But, but if you meet really early on you know, to get that relationship going, I think we have a better chance of reunifying those children in a timely manner. And also having the information, as much information as possible about the child. So we can start that process out correctly as well. Um, this is, I'm not, we're not, I'm not going to read this, but when we were collaborating and looking at this, uh, we were, I was thinking of a visual um, for this project. And I came up with the concept of a, a, child, a child being a quilt in a family. And each piece of the patchwork is very unique. And you keep building on to that as well as um, foster parents, you know, whoever comes into that child's life, that's forever in their quilt. So when I found this wonderful poem that was very, um, matched what we were doing very, very well. And I'm, I'm not great at reciting, so. <laughs> When a patchwork is worn out and must be replaced, a new piece of cloth can be sewn in its face. But loved ones are so precious, each one so unique, they're priceless heirlooms we all want to keep. They can't be forgotten, our memories of them never end. They're in our hearts forever, we will always call them friend. You know, once a, a, a piece is torn out of that patchwork, you can put it back, but it's not going to look the same. Okay. Though quilts are like our families, they're made by human hands. Their colors fade, their fabric tears, they lose their great demand. <coughs> but families live forever throughout time across sea and land, for they are made by God alone through his eternal perfect plan. So we talked about um, the one thing we, the real basic that we have in common is we're parents. Um, so what is shared parenting? <coughs> Building, maintaining relationships and the communication between birth and foster families involved in the youth's life with the goal of supporting family reunification or another permanency plan, whatever that may look like. You know, and we've seen, um, I've seen foster and birth families work so closely together that it may come to a point where that birth family says, you know what, foster parent, I can't do this, but I want to be a part of the child's life. Will you be the parent and I'll, I'll just be there? You know, and you know what that takes for, for a for a for a birth parent to do that. I mean, that's that's awesome. You know, so um, an example of that is is uh, Pam was sharing with me a foster mom, small small community in central Nebraska, mom five kids, single parent, overwhelmed, young, and she um, has her children removed because the house is a disaster basically. Um, and the foster mom happens to be in the same small community. Fortunately, that's a good thing. But um, they ended up building this incredible relationship. So there was safety. Those kids had safety. The mom and foster mom built a relationship that still, how many years has it been now? It's been eight years. Eight years. They still have this bond that these kids, they rely on each other. And a couple years ago, after, because um, foster mom went over and helped organize the house, not only organized, but you know, showed her some some new skills on how to keep that going. Plus, she had that support, you know, in the community when she needed that for the for the kids as well. But a couple of years back, she ended up kind of the same situation again, overwhelmed. But this time, then foster mom could go in um, and help. But the kids went back to the same foster mom, so there wasn't that new placement, transition, all of the things that come with that. There was no disruption, in the, as much disruption in the life. And kids are home and things are going well again. One of the core 
philosophies of foster uh, care families concentrates on the importance of family relationships in the treatment of children in care. While the foster families work with the foster child to develop positive changes, the biological families need um, skills to support their changes and work on the family issues that initiate foster care. Um, we've met with, we've been meeting across the state with a lot of our foster parents and our bio parents and having these conversations. Um, one of the issues that many foster parents talk about is their concern with sometimes it feels like to them that the focus is reunification, is working with the parents, that it feels that them that it's not being focused on the child. So we wanted to make sure we're being clear that um, you know the family organizations are there to support and build skills and help with those resources they need, but the foster parents are there for the children. The foster biological family relationship has a significant impact on the placement and or treatment. Um, you know, if the foster parent and the bio parent are working together, that sets up a situation where the kids don't have to choose. You know, so oftentimes, you know, kids feel safe in a foster home and they kind of get to like that foster mom and dad a little bit. And, and gosh, is that, you know, if they like the foster mom and dad, is that bad? You know, and, and so if you set up a situation where the kids don't have to choose, everybody wins. A respectful, non-judgmental and supportive relationship helps parents meet their children's needs. You know, if, if that foster family can look at that birth parent and say, hey, you know, you're really not so bad. You know, I'm here to help you get your children back. We all know that kids love their birth family. All kids love their birth family. And statistics show that 90% of the children that are adopted, whether they're adopted as infants or older children, seek out that birth family. And many of them go back to stay. Not all of them, but many of them go back to stay. They all have that yearning for that birth family. Parents are gonna experience less anger, fewer feelings of shame, less worry about the care that their children are receiving. You know, I like the birth family to see where their kids are sleeping at night. I want them to come to my house. I want them to experience our family life. When appropriate. When appropriate, yeah, it's not always. Um, when parents experience less anxiety, they have more energy to focus on their own treatment. You know, if, if I had my children come in, go into care and I didn't know who had them, I would be pretty angry at that family because I would feel like they're taking my kids away. You know, but if they, you can meet with a foster family and if we can work with foster families to get them to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Mrs. Allen and, and I'm here to take care of your kids and help you get them back. I'm not here to keep them. That can start things off on a good... That statement right there is so very impactful for the families. Um, you said that you'd like to see this happen within 48 hours and I know with parents coming into court at that first uh, hearing, you know, we have some, some anger issues and some different things. Who facilitates that? If, I mean, if you want that together in 48 hours, if appropriate, <coughs> who facilitates it? We, we actually address that oh, in here, but yeah, in there. so explain it more. When parents and foster parents work together, kids go home more quickly and stay home. Um, the, if kids go home quickly and they can stay home because they still have that foster family as that informal support. You know, I had um, one young lady that we'd had for two and a half years and, and she was 15 and she went home and about 11 o'clock one night her mom called and she said, you've got to come. We're in crisis. She's screaming at me. She's throwing things. You've got to come. You've got to come. I went over and was able to sit with that family, de-escalate that situation enough that I could leave and that child stayed home. Now, if she had called the police or how the human services had gotten involved again, probably that child would have come back out of that home. But because she had an informal support to call, we were able to avoid that. And it prevents that feeling so many times the families feel that uh, experience isolation. They have someone to turn to that they know understands and has that rapport with their child. Um, kids get better care as parents and foster parents exchange information about the child and work together to make the visits pos uh, positive. Kids feel less worried about their families. Many kids are worried about loyalty, as Pam had talked about. If they like the foster parents, does that mean they can't like the parents anymore? That, um, they feel better if they can see that the foster parents aren't getting along. 
and honestly too what we experience with some of our older kids um, some triangulation going on and that prevents that from happening as well <clears throat> Ongoing relationships. In foster care, when we train pride training, we teach forever families. We teach forever <coughs> relationships. Um, just because a child goes home doesn't mean that relationship with the foster family has to end. Foster family could be aunt or uncle, in my case, grandma or grandpa. Oh, I hate to say that. <laughs> but that relationship can be ongoing. It doesn't have to end just because a child goes home. And we just, I just love some of the stories that um, some of the po foster parents have shared anecdotally about those long-term relationships and what those are like and what's been accomplished. And, and we, I, when, I, when we were looking for clip art and looking, I found this little piece of embroidery here and I thought it was so appropriate for our kids and how they're feeling when they, they have that positive, accepting um, uh, relationship that I know I'm in my own little world, it's okay, they know me here. And that's, so that's where we began this, um, decided to create this pilot project. And I bet when they saw the icebreaker, they all thought they were gonna have to get up and do stuff this morning. Ah. <laughs> icebreaker meetings, uh, recent national movement for providing, and to tell you the truth, we didn't know it was a recent, uh, it was a national movement when we started looking at this and planning it. So we were very excited when we found more data about this. Um, it provides planning strategies or icebreaker meetings for bringing foster families and birth families of children in care together. Public and private agencies have changed policies and protocols about contact between foster families, birth families, while revamping their training for foster parents and staff. And uh, both of our agencies have um, changed our some policies and trainings and that collaboration looks very different as well and one of the big uh, agencies that is actually working with this icebreaker is the Casey Foundation icebreaker meetings allow foster families to find out the things that they need to find out about the children early on not everything was bad in that birth home they probably did stuff that worked and that foster family, it's a good thing to find that out early on. You know, this is what worked for us or, or this is what didn't. And you know, if you've got a little one, the scariest thing for me, putting a new young child to bed at night when they come into foster care. I've had kids come into my home at two or three o'clock in the morning and have to put them to bed. And you know, did that child need a blanket or, or a stuffed animal or, you know, was there something special? Was there a transition item that they should have had that they didn't come with? That birth parent will know that. Children benefit because there's going to be less conflict and tensions. And again, we talked about the divided loyalty, decreased loss of, decreased sense of loss and abandonment. And that triangulation piece is huge. If they know the parents are working together, my kids know I'll pick up, they say something to me and I'll pick up the phone and call their birth parent. No, don't do that. You're right, you're right, you know. so. You know, I don't have a problem calling birth parents. <laughs> Recently, we, the, in FAPA and the Federation, we decided that we were going to work together. You know, you hear siloing all the time. Well, we were kind of in our own little silos, and Candy and I kept bumping into each other and decided, you know, we must be supposed to do stuff. So we decided to start this um, pilot project, and we are going to pilot it mostly right now in the central service area. Icebreaker meetings, communication between families. The term icebreaker meeting is being used in many parts of the country to describe the initial structured meeting between birth parents and foster parents. An icebreaker meeting is facilitated, child-focused meeting held shortly after a child is placed. The meeting provides an opportunity for foster parents and birth families to meet each other, to share information. It's a starting point for establishing communication. Uh, and building a relationship between the families. Foster families are encouraged to share information about themselves and their family, um, which will help to alleviate the anxiety of the birth family. So um, when we say share information, uh, we decided that, um, oh, one of the questions that we, what was it we decided to exclude because we ran into a little. Why, why I began foster. Why I became a foster parent. Because I don't want foster families to say, well, I started fostering to adopt. 
Holy crap. Yeah. Know, what's that going to start? That's we didn't think about that. about relationships. That. <laughs> <laughs> because most of the time, that's why families begin fostering, is to adopt. Okay? And we don't want to say that. We want the opposite experience. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to take that out. Um, we want to know how long the family's been, been, been doing foster care. You know? That might be important for that birth family to know. Who all lives in the home? What are, who, are, who are the people that my child is going to be involved with? And that's very important. Um, foster homes have children and um, grandmothers or, you know, it's a typical family. So it's very important for that fa the bio family to see, you know, what that looks like and understand that. We want that foster parent to assure that birth family that they're not trying to take their place. You know, a lot of families have written rules. It's nice to take the written rules and show that birth family what your written rules are. You know, maybe if the birth family had written rules, that might help at their home. And we also, some of our conversations with foster parents, it also really helps to set some really strong boundaries. Um, some of the, uh, maybe so, the bio family knows when it's okay to call, when to call, uh, what works, how, what kind of communication style for both of them. So uh, right, right away, so they don't have some misunderstandings. Daily routines, and you're going to talk about the child's progress ongoing. And when you're talking about 48 hours, child's progress, it may it may be simply how did they sleep, or you know, uh, just but they have some words about how that's going the first night when or the first couple days. Uh, birth families are encouraged to tell foster parents important things about the child, such as medical concerns and allergies. You know, I've got dogs in my home. If I've got a kiddo in my house that's allergic to dogs, that's probably not a good thing. Um, what's a child's normal schedule or routine? Um, the two kiddos that I have in my home right now, I've got a three-year-old that absolutely takes four hours to get to sleep at night. He's everywhere but on where he needs to be. He's jumping up and down, he's turning somersaults, he's doing, and mom's, I'm talking to her on the phone the other night, she said, yeah, I had that problem too, you know. Um, important cultural or family traditions. You know, if that birth family has, has some cultural traditions, let's try and bring them into that foster home, okay? Um, items, transition items that, that may be important to the child, like a blanket or a stuffed toy or something. Educational behavioral concerns. Does the child have an IEP? You know, birth parents hold educational rights. Um, if the child, we don't encourage the child to participate in this um, uh, icebreaker meeting, actually. But we thought we'd put it in there if there may some, be some older youth that really feel strongly that they'd like to be involved in that communication. And this is an opportunity for the birth families to ask lots of questions. The meetings are being facilitated by both NFAPA and the Federation. So we have two facilitators there. It's going to be, it's held at one of our offices or another neutral location. The meeting should be kept relatively short, usually less than 60 minutes. It's just the initial sharing process. A follow-up uh, and a follow-up, we're doing evaluations, collecting data on this, we will be. So a follow-up evaluation will occur later in the course of treatment or placement. Going to make sure the facilitator will make sure the introductions are made, reminds participants of the meeting's purpose, helps each participant get started, ensures that the meeting stays on track, helps families maintain appropriate boundaries for a first contact, and helps structure a short term plan for future contacts or visits. Again, when we say these, um, these initial visits, only when it's appropriate. If there's safety concerns or we, we do not wish to create more conflict or problems. The emphasis on ensuring um, birth family involvement for the child in foster care has been a part of many reviews, such as the CFSR review um, done and uh, by the Health, Health and Human Services, which we do. Icebreaker meetings provide our treatment teams with a relatively simple way to highlight and begin the process of creating respectful and supportive relationships between the foster and biological family. Questions? 
Um, and actually, and that's another little poem, and it is facilitated by INFAPA in the Federation. Um, this is not inclusive. It, it's um, not inclusive of a case worker. It's just that collaborative communication. There's no goal setting here or treatment plans or it's just strictly to get that, um, you know, for them to physically communicate, meet each other, and get the information about the child. Yes. So who's doing that? Um, the, the caseworker needs to call and say, I've got this family. So and it's triggered by it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we would have no way of knowing. Right. Yeah. Other questions? And we also don't have, and see, there's no conflict, and we can sh communicate this. The process was, for instance, Boys and Girls Home with both having contracts, and we already have those releases of information to share the information. So there's, there's no liability with that. Okay, thank you. Right on time. All right. <laughs>